is a social justice, hunger-fighting badass, if you'll pardon the French. And I'm really excited to welcome to the stage from Gardening the Community and the Springfield Food Policy Council, our final speaker of the evening, Liz O'Gilvie. I'm moving slow and I'm a little stiff because I forget I'm not 20 and I worked in my compost heap this week. This theme this year in the weeds, when I heard it, I thought about not having used that theme for a really long time since I was a server, although back in the olden, olden days, as my 14-year-old called them, they called us waitresses. And we used the term in the weeds when our sections got really full and there were so many people, we couldn't serve them well. Hearing in the weeds made me think about COVID. As a black person, and as a black person working in food system change and food access, I live my life in the weeds. Never so much, though, as during COVID. Those were weeds unlike anything I'd ever seen. And they felt like they were going to pull me and everyone else under. Folks were calling from the GTC farm store telling me stories about how many people had come that day asking if we had anything that was spoiling because they had nothing to eat. I had one of the youth we work with send me a text and say, Miss Liz, can I skip school and work on the farm a couple of days this week just to get more food for my family? I remember it was April, and my friend Maria Marrera, who was the founding executive, direct, executive director of World Farmers, an incubator farm that works with BIPOC immigrant farmers in Lancaster in Worcester County, she called me up nearly in tears saying she didn't know what was going to happen with her farmers that year because most of them took their food to farmers markets. And even though the markets were still operating, they were being told they couldn't come. And I asked her the name of the market manager, and it at the moment didn't ring a bell, but something was familiar about it. And she said, I know this is about their color. Maria is an immigrant from the Azores, but most of the farmers she works with are Southeast Asian and African immigrants from various countries on the continent. But I had done some work with farmers markets because she said asked me to do some training on creating a warm and welcoming environment for all people. So I called this market manager up. I don't know if it's because I'm the oldest in my family or because I work in food, I always think I can fix a thing. And I'm comfortable with the discomfort that comes when we talk about race. So I called her, asked her how she was doing. She told me about all their safety protocols. And, and then I said, well, help me understand why you're telling the world farmers farmers that they can't come. And she said, well, you know, the Chinese brought it here. And the black people, it's spreading like flies. And they're too scary and too risky. They'll scare my customers away. She and I had met at this training, so I said, you remember I'm black, right? <laughs> and she said, yes, but not that kind. And she said, you don't have to worry about it where you come from. You people just don't have to worry about these things. So I conjured up all the home training that everyone in my family had invested in me. And I ended that call politely, even as I was thinking, I got some you people for you. And I sat there with my head in my hands, not wanting to call Maria and tell her I failed. And I see a text on my phone, did you see how much more money the food banks are getting? And it was some crazy dollar amount. And people who know me know that I say any food is better than no food. But the truth is, for people in my community, who have high, the highest rates in Massachusetts and rival states in the South of diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease. Food bank food is necessary so they don't go hungry, but it's the same kind of commodities food my family had to pick up in the really olden days before we had food stamps. And it's not the food that makes you healthy. So I'm sitting there wondering how I'm gonna help the world farmers farmers 
I read this message, I know I don't have any food, and I go on Facebook and write a rant. And I used to say I never do that, but now I do it about once a year because something pisses me off. <laughs> but in my rant, I talked about how these centuries of inequities had led us to a place where the reason that black people seem to be spreading it, or at the very least getting it more than everyone else and dying from it, was because we had all these food-related preventable diseases and boxes that had macaroni and cheese in them, mixes, but with no milk or butter to make them, and jars of peanut butter was not going to solve these problems. And a friend who has resources saw it and called me up and said, what should I do? Should I give the food bank money so they can buy more healthy food? And I yelled, no, give it to me. I have to raise money for these two organizations, but I never do things like that. And she said, what would you do? And I said, I would buy the World Farmers food and I'd give it away to people who don't have public benefits or who have them and it's not enough. And I'd put in some backyard gardens because kids are stuck at home with their families and they don't know what to do. And I was a school garden teacher and I knew how to build a four by eight res bed. And she said, okay. And she didn't just stop there. She called a friend and more friends. And those friends called friends. And by then it was May and George Floyd had been murdered. And suddenly all these COVID emergency grant opportunities showed up. And maybe they were COVID or maybe they were just white guilt. In any case, I'd never chased money, but I chased it. And every dollar that came into our fiscal agent, I said, send it to World Farmers, and we raised $300,000 that year. <laughs> and the farmers were thrilled to know that they were feeding black and brown people, many of whom came from the same countries they came from. Recently, I'm not talking about me in that really wretched boat ride 400 plus years ago. They were thrilled to be feeding people who really appreciated their food. And Maria and I made a commitment that we were going to do this all the time. We were going to institutionalize it in our organizations. And since then, we have brought nearly a million dollars in locally grown produce and proteins to people in the greater Springfield area. And I grew up on commodities and food stamps. And we're well over a million dollars now. And people ask me, on top of your organizational budget, you keep raising this money, how do you do it? It was because I was inspired. I think the second or third chair box in that first year, and I'm talking about 400 families a year that we feed with these boxes through the entire growing season, and then again in November and in December, there was a little boy who opened the share and saw that there were blueberries. And poor kids don't get blueberries or blackberries or even grapes because when you get $120 a month for food stamps, there's no room for fruit. And he said, what are these? And I said, they're blueberries. And I too was surprised that there were blueberries in the share. And Maria had sent me a picture of the farmer who grew the blueberries because she knew it would make me happy. And so when this little boy tried them and he said they taste like candy, I said, that's what Farmer Al, the farmer who grew them for you, says they taste like. And I pulled out my cell phone and I showed him his picture. And the first picture that came up were of Farmer Al's hands and then his whole body. And this little boy looked at me and he said, he looks like my grandfather. Black people are farmers? And I said, yes, I'm a farmer. And he looked at me with all this wonder. My grandmother was a sharecropper. Her grandmother was a slave. And I'm a farmer. Uh, 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 uh,